All right, everybody, welcome. Um, we're gonna get started. Um, um, so just let me say this again. Um, I'm gonna ask everybody to keep your computers on mute and stop your video um, until the end where we will, uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, Dr. Hatch has um, invited uh, everyone who's interested to throw their ideas, uh, their feelings, comments, questions in the chat box, which we'll get to. Um, and so we're gonna get started right now. Um, I would like to just take this opportunity to welcome um, everyone, students, faculty, staff, alumni, and community members this evening via Zoom, um, and we usually meet in person, but the pandemic has changed things. Um, but anyway, we'll do our best to celebrate, celebrate Black History Month um, by showcasing uh, a visiting African-American scholar to present a keynote speech of their work. Um, Dr. Hatch has also spent the day meeting with different student groups, um, and that's part of the program. Um, that we, we have every year. Uh, this year, we're gonna welcome Dr. Anthony Hatch as the Wagner College Black History Month Scholar for 2022. Welcome back to Dr. Hatch. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to also thank the interim provost, Nick Richardson, for support, uh, sponsoring the annual Black History Month Scholar Lecture Series. I would also like to express uh, our gratitude to the Eastern Sociological Society, and in particular, ESS Vice President, Dr. Laurel smith Dore, and the Society Committee for selecting Wagner College as the site for the Robin E. Williams Distinguished Lecture. I'd also like to thank Dr. Bernadette Ludwig for, for her efforts in helping, bringing, uh, helping to bring Dr. Hatch to Wagner. Now I'm gonna throw this over to um, our, uh, our Vice President of Admissions and Student Affairs, Dr. Ruta <laughs> Sean Gordon. Please forgive me, she is wearing so many hats that it's kind of hard to keep up with her in, ter in terms of what her title is. So my apologies, <laughs> Dr. Sean Gordon. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Reynolds. And I often forget my own title as well. So it's all good. <laughs> Uh, on behalf of President Aremo and Wagner College, I want to welcome all of you to the kickoff event for Black History Month 2022 with the Black Scholars Lecture Series. We've been doing this series for about 10 years, and we look forward to post-COVID times when we can all be together in person for these important events and conversations. I want to thank all of you for joining us this evening, and I hope that you'll be able to attend the other events that we have planned for the month, such as the Read-In, the Black History Month Jeopardy, the Jazz Concert, and the Martin Luther King Jr. Agent of Change Awards. I also want to thank Dr. Anthony Hatch for meeting with our students and classes virtually today and for joining us this evening to engage us in conversations about race and health disparities. And I do hope, Dr. Hatch, that you will be able to join us in person next year because we'd love to meet you and shake your hand. That would be fantastic. Thank okay, so you. let me take a moment. All right, I'm sorry, Dr. Shaw, are you done? Yes, I just wanted okay. to say thank you to you as well. Thank you for being with us. Um, I'm gonna take a moment to introduce Dr. Anthony Hatch, a pretty impressive colleague. Um, Dr. Hatch is an associate professor and chair of the Science and Society program at Wesleyan University, where he is affiliated with the departments of African-American studies and sociology and the College of the Environment, Dr. Hatch, is an expert on how medicine and technology impact social inequalities in health 
and is the author of Blood Sugar. Um, I'm sorry, let me take off my glasses so you can to, to see this. Uh, Racial Pharmacology and Food Justice in Black America, which um, critiques how biomedical science scientists, government researchers, and drug companies use concepts of race and ethnicity to study and treat metabolic syndrome. His second book, Silent Cells, The Secret Drugging of Captive America, examines how custodial institutions like prisons, nursing homes, and the U.S. military, military excuse me, use <clears throat> psychotropic drugs to manage captive populations in the United States. Dr. Hatch is also the 2021-2022 Robin E. Williams Distinguished Lecturer for the Eastern Sociological Society. Dr. Hatch has a PhD from the University of Maryland at College Park in Sociology. Tonight's talk is entitled, The Data Will Not Save Us, Afro-Pessimism in the COVID-19 Archives. Dr. Hatch. There we go. Thank you so much, Dr. Reynolds. Thank you so much. I was needing to unmute myself. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I need to be able to do that. To make me a co-host quickly. And then I'll pull this up. And while we do that, um, let me see. There we go. One and two. So again, thank you to everyone for taking time tonight. Let me just first thank professors Bernadette Ludwig, Rita Reynolds, Edna Aurelis, and their students, as well as Provost Stanley and President Arimo for their time and attention today. I'm grateful for all of you taking time tonight to, to come and listen to this talk um, and share in these ideas. This is the Robin Williams Distinguished Lecture through the Eastern Sociological Society in honor of Professor Williams, who was a longtime professor of sociology at Cornell University. I'd also like to start by acknowledging my student research associates in Black Box Labs for their research support on this and other projects. This lecture is accompanied by a forthcoming article. It literally will be out next week as soon as I can finish the proofs um, in, a, in a, spe a special issue of the journal Big Data and Society on data, power, and racial formation of the same title, racial, uh, the data will not save us, Afro-pessimism and racial antimatter in the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that'll be out again, probably next week, and I'll make sure to send that along. So I wanna jump right in. As a matter of public knowledge, it's still not a straightforward matter, nor will it ever be to figure out exactly out of uh, out of how many of the over 900,338 Americans who've died so far from complications due to COVID-19 are black. According to what appears to be a reputable government source shown here, the CDC's COVID data tracker, about 13.7% of total deaths are among people the government classifies as black. But this percentage comes with a big caveat. The race ethnicity of the dead is known in roughly only about 85% of deaths. So you see on the slide right there in the middle there, the top of that slide, uh, data from 760,000 deaths, race or ethnicity was available for only 85% of deaths. And this number I should note has steadily increased over the past year and a half or so from the mid seventies up to about 85%. So in the same epistemological space where the virus's mortal violence is only partially known by the state, at the same time, a massive data archive is being erected out of all sorts of heterogeneous forms of racial data on the COVID-19 pandemic, including data on deaths, infections, forgive me, testing, hospitalizations, disablements, vaccination rates, cultural attitudes. The COVID-19 data archive is indexed with race, just not just because of the material death of so many Black people, 
but because racism is a core building block of the infrastructure of state biomedicine, health journalism, and corporate health care in the United States. The COVID-19 data archives were built, at least in part, inside data infrastructures created by the Trump administration, who misused and manipulated scientific data and medical knowledge in the COVID-19 pandemic to benefit the former president's reelection campaign and reproduce white supremacy. Among their misdeeds in this domain were both their actions and inactions taken in response to public knowledge of racial disparities across domains of the pandemic. In other words, the Trump people knew that poor people, older people, prisoners, agricultural workers, and specifically black people were dying in the pandemic <clears throat> and demonically that seemed to be part of the plan. When the assumption is that black life will be shorter, more diseased, more painful, and that there will generally be more death in and around black communities, the massive data archive can only communicate one message, blackness equals death. You see, the first tactic of necropolitics is to dehumanize human beings by objectifying them, turning a fleshy human being into a number, for example, and repeatedly describing them as an enemy who is killable. So here there is a hyperfixation on and an infrastructure built to produce all sorts of racialized objectifications of all kinds, including numbers, rates, percentages, risk estimations, abstractions, what post-colonial theorist Amy Cesare called thingifications. In this talk, I'll argue that racial disparities data constitute a kind of racial spectacle that in the words of Angelique Davis and Rose Ernst, simultaneously both demonstrates and obfuscates, hides the existence of a white supremacist power structure. So once an enemy population has been sufficiently dehumanized and vilified, state officials and elites slide into what's called a state of exception, where they deploy uh, extra legal, not legal practices that suspend rights and segregate enemy populations territorially, while simultaneously proclaiming that the violence that's being carried out is done in the name of security or peace or health. So the spectacle of black death you see here in these numbers, potential years of life lost, infant mortality rate, one, one we had to calculate by hand, that's the police kill rate per million. You see that disparity there, right? Um, that actually has to be computed by hand because there's no infrastructure in the US to compute this. We had to rely on data from The Guardian, an independent newspaper in the UK for data on police killings. Um, so this is important. The spectacle of black death is not accidental nor is it easily fixable because officials often use overwhelming techno-scientific force uh, and overwhelming carceral technologies to sabotage infrastructures for living, right? So they don't necessarily have to kill you. They can just take away the things you need to live. And this is, is what, as Ruha Benjamin and so many others have convincingly shown. So given these kinds of data, I wanna borrow from Janet Jackson's classic, I want to ask, what has the data done for us lately? Has the COVID-19 data helped Black people by materially improving their health and extending their lives? One can assume that the data may have had the effect of alerting Black people to the unique dangers they faced in the pandemic, but I don't think Black people needed, to, needed an archive of data to be alerted to the mortal danger they faced in the pandemic. So who and what is the data for? Now, for those who don't know, this is Janet Jackson. And this is from the album uh, Control 1986. What have you done for me lately? It's about Janet Jackson. She she's plays a, a, you know, in, in the song, uh, she, and in the, particularly in the video, it's her and Paula Abdul, they're in a diner. And she's in, and Janet Jackson's complaining about her, the boyfriend. And she's saying, the boyfriend used to do nice things. He used to take you out. He used to, you know, make all these promises. But what has he done for you lately? And there's a, a rap in the song where Janet says this. 
you know, she says, you ought to be thankful. This is her speaking to the boyfriend. You ought to be thankful for the little things, but little things are all you seem to give. You're always putting off what we could do today. Soap opera says, you've got one life to live. Who's right? Who's wrong? And it's, you're always putting off what we could do today, right? What have you done for me lately? You can hear the song in your head now. The fact that racial health disparities, data science, can sometimes work to identify the fundamental causes of disease is paradoxically central to its appeal as a racial spectacle because it sanctions the archive itself as somehow anti-racist. The COVID-19 does help anti-racist scientists speak truth to power. At the same time, it makes the truth of racial inequality available as a technology of a racist state. And the case of COVID-19 might help illuminate how racial spectacles work to shore up and reproduce racial health inequality by facilitating and institutionalizing malignant forms of medical neglect, like withdrawal, directed toward Black people. My colleague Ruha Benjamin frames it this way, the facts alone will not save us. Thinking with Ruha, I fear that all of the careful empirical work, not just in the pandemic, but over the last 50 years of health inequalities research, will not be enough to stem the tide of anti-Black racism as it washes over Black bodies. The facts alone will not save us, she cautions. The painstaking calculation of racism's effects on Black people is a necessary but insufficient condition for saving Black people's lives. So if the data has not saved us yet, why not? To explore this question, I turn to Afro-pessimism as an interpretive framework aligned with critical race theory for reconciling this stalled or kind of failed project of racial health justice, considering the ongoing, ongoing COVID-19 pandemic as a case study to explore this ongoing failure. Um, in this work, I draw upon uh, critical race, feminist, and STS, science and technology studies, interpretations of racial spectacles and cultural gaslighting to understand the narrative and ideological processes involved in circulating knowledge about racism and health. So racial spectacles function as the narrative vehicles for symbols, imagery, and language that convey the privately held emotions and ideologies that accompany and work to obfuscate and, pardon me, obfuscate and uh, to illuminate the existence of a white supremacist power structure. The racial spectacle of black death, right? This kind of, there's always disparities assumed to exist at the outset, creates the epistemic conditions for what's called cultural gaslighting. Right, which is a conceptual ruse that diverts attention away from structural epistemic oppressions that continue to underwrite the colonial project. And this is the brilliant work of my colleague, Elena Ruiz and Nora Bernstein and many others thinking about kind of cultural and structural gaslighting that because of the spectacle to show, all of a sudden we're watching that and we're not paying attention to the ways in which knowledge is being made that both shores up the show, but also keeps us distracted from underlying structural causes of epistemic and material oppression. Um, so these ideas are useful in the context of Afro pessimism, which in our and understanding it. And so the idea is is that that Afro pessimism is, is Afro pessimism is like the the motif, the grand theme of racial spectacles. The idea that Africa and Africans and anybody black from descended from Africa is beyond help right, that we ought to be pessimistic about their chances. That's what the, the motif is, right, that, that little can be done, right. Um, and this is tied to both the racial spectacle and to cultural gaslighting that accompanies not just North American racial rule, but global post-colonial rule. So to break this down a little bit, right, Afro-pessimism is a loose body of critical race theories that examine the polyvalent multiple meanings of blackness 
and heterogeneous lived experiences of Black people that accompany the violent anti-Black racisms that constitute the afterlives of slavery. Um, uh, including both self-described Afro-pessimists and scholars whose work might reasonably be characterized as such, the Black scholars who are most closely aligned with Afro-pessimism are literary scholars and humanists, right? Humanities scholars, forgive me, who work in the critical humanities and who are generally not kind of social or natural scientists. One notable exception is the sociologist Orlando Patterson, who is a 1982-83 book, Slavery and Social Death, a comparative study, argued that the violence, um, social dishonor, and natal alienation, or separation from one's genealogical line of birth, constitute uh, a, a complex kind of ontological situation called social death, shown in the slide, for the slave, right? Um, the concept of social death helps Afro-pessimists explain how transnational slavery and its afterlives established this discursive relationship shown in this equation, whereby blackness becomes equated with slave, which is also equated with a kind of fungible form of capital, right? Um, a, a fungible commodity that can be flipped, parlayed into any form of currency that's required. Um, to achieve disposability and uh, replaceability and reproducibility under chattel slavery. So the black person who is enslaved must be regarded as kind of a non-human um, so that non-black humans can neatly inhabit the category of humanity and enjoy all the privileges and rights assigned thereunto. This is the work of Sadia Hartman, right? Really interrogating this, this meaning of of human and who gets to kind of fit in that category and how the relations of, of, of slavery establish not just a kind of a, a metaphorical relationship but an actual legal arrangement um, that permeates through the decades. Um, Afro-pessimists broadly assert um, the essentialist premise, and this is this point here, that there's a kind of a strict like ontological hierarchy between these non-Black human beings over non-Black beings. Um, by asserting and recognizing this kind of hierarchy, Afro-pessimism relies on a form of racial essentialism to render Black subjects as outside the definition of the human. Now, this is one point where Afro-pessimism deviates, in my mind, from the broader body of critical race theory within social sciences and legal studies on the question of the ontology or being of race and blackness, right? Racial essentialism describes a way of interpreting kind of putative racial differences that relies on the assumption that race categories are natural based on essences, right? Racial essentialism. So the intellectual utility of Afro-pessimism, like how much we use it and how we use it, is kind of hindered in part by its kind of incompatibility with how we understand race to be something that's intersectional, actually. So inter, uh, this is compatible with an intersectional analysis of gender, social class, and nationalism, but broadly its political sentiments are consistent, right? Um, this critique of racial essentialism is really important because it's been the vector through which biological understandings of race have gotten through what Troy Duster calls the back door, right? By relying on racial essentialism, you allow for new forms of scientific racism to take hold. Now, the theory part's almost over, at least in, in the sense for you, but these ontological and philosophical issues matter because how race is defined and operationalized remains really fraught and controversial in health inequalities data science, right? How race is measured in COVID-19 research, for example, as I showed you in the first slide, and the kind of federal epidemiological data requirements, they don't always translate onto these kind of theoretical ideas coming out of Afro-pessimists' mouths. One idea I do draw on, and this is important to, to the framing of this talk is that Afro-pessimists offer a kind of challenge to racial progress narratives. And Victor Ray and, and many others are, are doing this work, right? Um, that we, we don't always view what we've been through as progress. We should not assume it's progress. 
And in the context of epidemiology, counting the dead, right, um, can sometimes force a partial reckoning with racial inequality, right? We do, we do the analysis, we see a racial structure producing death, and sometimes it can force a kind of partial reckoning. But when viewed through this framework of Afro-pessimism, that reckoning reveals itself to be a kind of liberal progress narrative, right? The progress narrative is that the collection and analysis of racial data will inexorably and inevitably always lead to somehow the reduction and elimination of racial health disparities. Now, counting the dead is not enough. In a scenario where the institutions of state that are supposed to protect public health kind of collapsed, and elites used the pandemic to further enrich themselves. I mean, what was it that the 10 wealthiest men in the world, uh, the 10 wealthiest billionaires in the world doubled their wealth in the last two years? Argue with me about this. So while anti-racist health scholars were diligently calling for more data early in the pandemic, the Trump regime's inaction was really linked to what they knew to be the case. Right, the disproportionate black suffering, which is what they kind of wanted to, to facilitate to uh, in line with these Afro pessimist arguments. Now, only a regime that would traffic in what I call black antimatter, which wholly discounts the humanity of its black citizenry, can do such a thing. So, scholarly interpretations of dark matter, race as dark matter, offer an innovative way to theorize the socially invisible. Uh, politically unstable and ontologically mysterious ways in which racisms like these shape society. Literary scholars, social and natural scientists, accounts of dark matter postulate a direct kind of metaphorical relationship where race operates as dark matter. Right here, I'll point you to to racial formation theorist Howard Why Not his piece uh, and or Simone Brown her brilliant work Dark. Matters, uh, or more most recently, uh, Shonda Westcott, uh, Prescott Weinstein's work, The Disordered Cosmos, explore kind of race as dark matter. Yet, in contemporary particle physics, how scientists sort differences between like regular matter, antimatter, and dark matter itself is not easy to understand. I'm not even going to try. Now, in theory, dark matter seems to be behave less like regular matter than antimatter does. Um, and in other words, antimatter and regular matter kind of look alike, but they're polarized differently. Right? This raises the question for me, and I explore this at, at length in the paper, of whether dark matter is the appropriate metaphor for describing the micro and macro physics of racial power that circulate in racial spectacles. For as much of these analyses of dark matter highlight unseen or invisible processes, it remains vital to pay attention to what Michael Rodriguez Muniz calls the socio-technical materiality of race, and what Amade Amcharik, my colleague, calls the materiality of race in practice. So by tracing the relations between the kind of institutional gaze and the structured inattention of science, government, and capitalism, which this is what facilitates the formation of what I call antimatter. So, um, uh, back in the another shout out to hip hop for um, Black Box Labs. Um, in the mid '90s, there was a, a beautiful rapper poet, my man Craig Mack, who had a song called "Flavor in Your Ear," and in the remix version of this song remixed by Puff Daddy, uh, I guess he's now Puff Diddy, uh, I'm not sure what his name is now. Um, there was a, a line in that song that always, it always caught my attention, but it, it really is relevant here. And there was a line where he says, I got the data to turn your body into antimatter. Um, racial antimatter forms when statistical data, like the data on COVID-19, is represented in spectacular racial terms. Um, uh, terms that enable the racial spectacle to form. And that enables a kind of forgetting. So we form the data, but then once we form the data, it enables a forgetting of the data and or the weaponization of the data uh, about racialized populations. These are the very same material and structural processes that are often obscured by structural gaslighting. 
So let me just slow this down a little bit. Again, Brother Craig Mack said, I got the data to turn your body into antimatter. Now, what did he mean by that? Now, in the song, he's talking about um, how his, his flow would enter, turn into data, enter into your body, and transform the listener. And there's a certain kind of transformation, I think, that's important for us to understand. So I want to offer you one kind of comparative slide to compare what we might think of as racial matter uh, and racial antimatter to try to characterize these relationships in an important way. Um, racial matter and racial antimatter kind of coexist in explosive tension because U.S. culture was defined by a callous disregard for the matter that made up Black people's bodies, right? These unequal and, uh, and opposite forces create both oppressive but also liberatory kinetic energies in multiple directions. So let's map this out a little bit. Epistemologically, in the first row, racial matter is aligned with philosophical materialism, which we can situate and resituate with scholars, feminist scholars like Karen Barad and Victoria Pitts Taylor, whose accounts of new materialism uh, allow us to capture uh, a kind of embodiment that um, both recognizes the, the discursivity of a body, the body that has a, me a meaning in terms of a text, but also is fleshy. Now, historian of science Theodore Porter um, labeled the eugenicist and statistician Carl Pearson of Pearson's Correlation. Pearson's, his, his brand of, of statistics as anti-materialist. This is Porter's term, anti-materialist, because, quote, Pearson's world was not a world of real objects, but a world of perceptions. In Pearson's view, statistics were mental constructions that could be investigated mathematically, but they did not correspond in, to nature in any representational way. Statistics are, in this sense, anti-materialist. But statistics are also materialist in this other meaning that we really want to embrace, because we know social classifications like those used in statistics are used strategically and systematically to order and design and build the social world, the world we live in. This is what racial formation is all about. Um, and then we use science to then measure the world we think is, is produced objectively. Sociologically, and this is row two, racial matter and racial antimatter are co-produced alongside and within America's national narratives of promissory or, in Kigana Yamada Taylor's words, predatory inclusion via biopolitics, right, focused on health improvement, right, increase and legalized permanent exclusion via necropolitics and this kind of ontological separation that the Afro-pessimists are talking about. So through the dual practices, and this is the technological piece at the bottom, of counting and not counting, right, um, we see this formation and this tension between racial matter and racial antimatter taking form. Black matter must be represented numerically and statistically so that it can be ignored, forgotten, or weaponized as, as racial antimatter. So this quantum property means that the same practice can mean kind of politically different things in terms of racism at the same time, counting and not being counted, being remembered and being forgotten, mattering and not mattering at all, are all bound up in the same kind of quantum state. Ideologically, this has problems for us because we kind of want black life to matter, but in order for that to happen, our society, this North American settler society would be forced to reckon with the contradictions between this promissory or predatory inclusion and this legalized exclusion. This, I don't think America, is ready to do and still be identical with itself. It has to become something different in order to reckon with this contradiction. In other words, it's very difficult for Black lives to matter in a political context where pernicious and sneaky, always present forms of racial antimatter kind of lurk at every point of touching, every point of contiguity between Black people in a racialized social structure. 
Okay. In the final section of the talk, I want to use these ideas to trace racial antimatter within the racial spectacles that formed around COVID-19 and the Trump administration's actions and inactions in that process with respect to Black people. So I'm going to really highlight three moments. This is quick. First, I trace the emergence of these kind of the revelation of, of racial truths. And here I am, I'm drawing on historian Keith Wiley's brilliant kind of dramaturgical framing of kind of how these narrative processes work. Um, now, March and April of 2020 were defined by the revelation of racial truths as epidemiological evidence documenting racial disparities about, you know, cases began to kind of trickle out. Um, important in this moment is the role of newspapers, journalistic outlets, the media, in, in circulating claims that more data was needed and to prescribe the role that data would play in ameliorating uh, racial disparities and, and other forms of health inequality. Um, second, I want to focus on events surrounding the kind of state authority handoff. Now, this happened in real terms in mid-April, but we didn't learn about it until the summer. When this is when Trump officials determined to kind of let the pandemic run its course and sabotage infrastructures for public health. Now, under the pretense of protecting or promoting liberty and freedom, this strategy left the public health of the nation, specifically the Black nation, uh, to state officials who could have cared less. As conditions of structural gaslighting require, the Trump administration's actions kind of furthered their program of institutional forgetting. Finally, uh, in late summer 2020, the Trump administration took extraordinary action um, to privatize and securitize the data systems that the federal government used to manage some of the pandemic related data. Now, uh, under this is under the dubious program HHS Protect, which I'll talk about in just a second. By positioning these events together within the same kind of racially speculative frame, I show how the collection of racial health disparities data comes up against white supremacists' political ambitions in a time space where the demand for human life to matter and the reiterative regeneration of racial antimatter collide. Now I'm gonna move through this right now here. Here we go, March 16, remember this, March 16, 2020, Trump declared a national state of emergency, <laughs> begrudgingly, I think. Now this established an alternative legal domain in which the US nation state can take extraordinary and extra legal actions to contain a threat to sovereignty, in this case one ostensibly due to the pandemic. Although, um, you know, there's been uh, reporting and analysis of the ways in which this declaration actually led to the continued um, capture and containment of, of migrant groups, U other US persons, non-citizens in the country, um, and other practices in the prison system. But I, that's a conversation for another day. March 16, same day, the, one of the first stories in the New York Times comes out, as coronavirus deepens inequality, inequality worsens its spread. Um, this was helped to establish the narrative that of the key COVID-19 risk factors, which were age, uh, pre-existing health conditions, right, diabetes, heart disease, overweight, and low socioeconomic status. Um, and this was all about kind of the poor in this in this in this piece. With no mention of race or racial inequalities, there's no really no need to. All the proper flagging had been done at, uh, uh, prior to. Uh, in the word, words of kind of Catherine McKittrick, the, the brilliant black geographer, this is all kind of pre-calculated and prefigured. March 22, in BuzzFeed, unable to publish their op-ed in places like the New York Times or elsewhere, a group of black doctors in Virginia were among the first to really raise alarm bells around um, who uh, who was getting access to testing at this time, right? There was very little data at the time about, you know, what racial disparities were and it was about who was getting access to the tests. Um, the doctors hoped that by having data on race and ethnicity, it would, quote, help to correct our by our disparities or biases as healthcare providers. Now, remember at the time, doctors were the 
the gatekeepers to testing and the doctors were deciding based upon symptomology and presentation who was going to get access to a test um which made the this gatekeeping function more important in terms of who was perceived to be at risk for the disease for the virus um dr cameron webb one of the doctors is reported to have said at the time you know that's a huge question who has access to the tests if you're not an nba player he said it might be a little harder for black people to get access to those tests. And he's referring to the NBA star Rudy Gobert. Remember Rudy Gobert, star for the Utah Jazz at the time? Uh, he had coronavirus, but he was in a press conference and was messed with a microphone and you know made light of it, but actually had COVID at the time. And that was who was getting access to testing at the time, NBA stars, it was perceived to be. March 27, or just a few days later, in Illinois, this is one of the first kind of early kind of local hard racial data published across several counties in Illinois, showing that among 488 new cases of COVID-19, 28% of them were among black folks. And um, that was, uh, you know, roughly double what they were expecting or hoping to be the case. And, and those data were, were really important. Um, but they also, uh, again, same day, a group of Democratic lawmakers um, wrote a letter to to HHS Secretary Alex Azar, compel the relevant federal health data uh, agencies to start collecting data on race and ethnicity because they weren't doing it um, at that time. And as they say in their letter, without this data, the uh, it's going to be impossible for practitioners and policymakers to address disparities. The lack of the information will make things worse, they say. And this is an axiomatic assumption right that you see all over the place that if we don't have the data things will be worse and i agree right this letter also states that a history of discrimination and marginalization has led some people of color to distrust the medical system so because of this legal exclusion of the past now there's distrust so now that you want to bring me in i don't trust it so that's also an issue right so this aims to kind of frame data collection as an act of inclusion as a matter, as opposed to exclusion. April 1, three days later, in the Atlantic, Ibram Kendi writes, why we don't know who the coronavirus victims are. Um, now, in this piece, it's important, and at this time, it's important to note that racial data was not available really anywhere at this time. The Centers for Disease Control, the data tracker that I showed at the beginning of the talk, that didn't have anything, it didn't really exist at the time. There was no tracking happening at that level, at least at, at this point. The, the Johns Hopkins COVID data tracker wasn't, dashboard wasn't tracking this question. The New York Times, the COVID tracking project, the University of Washington's folks weren't tracking this question. And so as of April 1st, Kindy writes, there's little, little publicly available data about the racial makeup in COVID-19 cases. Now, it's interesting because Kindy linked knowledge of racial disparities, like why we don't know this, to white people's feelings about Black suffering. And so what he said was, quote, maybe some people fear that the racial, if racial data were to show that COVID-19 dis disproportionately harming people of color, then white people will stop caring. Again, maybe some people will fear that if the racial data shows black suffering, that white people will stop caring. And I think that's interesting because as, as if this is a question of individual white persons caring and not an issue of an institutional apparatus that is designed to not pay attention to this kind of population-based suffering. Um, I think that's interesting on his part. Nonetheless, in the few next few days, April 6, 7, 9, more local data coming out of Louisiana, Michigan, Boston. On April 15th, Ibram Kendi and his colleagues actually respond to this problem and they launched the, the COVID racial data tracking center at the American University, which began to track these questions in, in, in to great effect. We're also now entering that second part of the talk because it's at this point, right at this moment, in early to mid-April, when the chief, former chief of staff, Mark Meadows, and his political group at the White House effected what the New York Times called, and what they called at the time, a state authority handoff of the pandemic to the, no, to the states. Almost like what happened um, at the end of the Civil War, in, at the end of the Civil War, didn't we leave it to the states, <laughs> as to, to the status of the Negro. Um, 
So I think this is an interesting thing that they did. Now, this was, of course, part of Trump's campaign um, to a remarkable public campaign against testing. He didn't want testing because remember he argued that more tests meant more cases and he needed cases to be going down because he was facing reelection in the fall. And in swing states, particularly in the South, across the South, he needed the pandemic to be getting better. And he thought the way to achieve that was by stifling the production of knowledge about the pandemic generally. Um, and so to give it to the states who have absolutely no institutional capacity for tracking this question uh, was a, 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 a move. And to do so in the context of a discourse around liberation was, um, was, was, was important. Because again, April 16, literally April 16, this is when the so-called anti-lockdown protests emerged in places like Michigan. And these were funded in part by kind of dark money, right? Um, and, and, and of having kind of shadowy origins. People were, were frustrated, but this was just a few weeks into the pandemic and um, we were still getting our minds around what, what in fact was happening to us. That's April 16, May 9. The coronavirus was an emergency until Trump found out who was dying, says Adam Sewer in The Atlantic, right? June 4, HHS announced new COVID data collection practices on race that would be effective like later in the summer, two months later, with no clear enforcement mechanism. They were kind of just rolling stuff out to try to try anything to see what would Get, get people to kind of be quiet. In fact, on June 4th, uh, in, as con, in the context of this apology, CDC Director Redfield apologized for the lack of racial disparity data on COVID. Um, I mean, it made it all the way to the journal Science in July. Huge hole in COVID-19 testing data makes it harder to study racial disparities. Then in July, same moment, the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, under a uh, kind of secret and troublesome contractual practice, a process, hired the private data firm Teletracker to build and maintain what's called HHS Protect. And here on the slide, I show you at the top. Uh, this is the point of portal of entry into this into this website. Um, now, this evacuated and completely circumvented the kind of long established practices within the CDC for reporting uh, data on uh, hospitalizations, available beds, a whole range of things. They outsourced it to this private corporation. Now, the initial contract was 10.3 million. Um, despite uh, questions around the irregularity of the contract highlighted in places like NPR shown in the, in the top there, um, this contract persisted. It was actually renewed uh, in 2021. You see here, Pittsburgh company uh, gets $13 million contract renewal. Now, when they established this, this HHS Protect system, there was a, a press release. Uh, and at the presser was Redfield and the chief information officer, Jose Arita. Uh, and this is, again, from the press release, and then there's the top of it there. Um, Arita says, HHS Protect, uh, uh, Protect gathers data from federal, state, and commercial sources. Um, he said, in response to the kind of obvious question, he said, there is no manipulation of this data possible within the system. Almost letting us know, right, that we, we couldn't, I know it looks really bad, but we couldn't possibly be manipulating this data in the system. It's not even possible. It's not possible, he said, while they're securitizing it and packing it up and moving it out. Of course, now with the Trump shredding, it's a whole different concept. But uh, he also says, you, you heard me mention security, which I want to emphasize we take very seriously. Now, I should mention HHS Protect gathered initially about 4 billion data points, and they were trying, you know, this is commercial sources, all sorts of data. This is like combing the data for the data. Um, in August uh, of 2020, the Department of Health and Human Services, again, a month later, refused to answer to congressional questioning about this contract, citing a, a non-disclosure agreement for this contract, which is what made it so un unusual. This was a Trumpian practice, the non-disclosure agreement. Now, I wonder who or what 
was specifically being securitized and fixed in place through this arrangement. They established practices and procedures within the CDC for protecting the public health data of the nation were not at data, they weren't a data risk. The real data risks were political for the Trump regime. If the public realized, as we have all now realized, the scale of negligence and malice governing how the Trump administration, how they responded to the pandemic, um, especially given their knowledge of racial inequalities that they allowed to unfold and in fact fostered, it could weaken, weaken Trump's electoral prospects in the upcoming election. So to close, I'd like to zoom out for one moment and, and ask the kind of broader question of the broader, not just COVID, but really anything. Has the data ever saved us? Has, by saving us, I mean, has the archive of data about racial health inequalities led to the reduction or elimination of even a single racial health disparity ever? An axiom, a law of any piece of racial health disparities data science is that whatever we found in this current study, no matter how clear the results were, no matter how strong they were, nor definitive, nor their significance, we're gonna need to do more research in the future to figure things out. More research is needed to specify the pathways and causal mechanisms that link systems of racial domination to reduced life chances for black people. Even among work of scholars whose work I have great, great respect and admiration for, I teach this piece in my class, right? This is in the American Journal of Public Health, Social Determinants of Health, Future Directions for Health Disparities Research. You know, these, these are the people doing the work. Even they say, to make progress in eliminating disparities, we need more than a yes or no judgment about the effects of social determinants of health. We need precise, pathway-specific, quantitative estimates. To me, racial health disparities is a racial project that has not yet achieved its goal of reducing or eliminating a single racial health disparity. I'm interested in exploring how racial health inequalities data science in this way it functions itself as a form of structural gaslighting that keeps scientists in an endless search for more and more refined measurements of racism's harms. This is racial matter. While the political and economic systems that comprise the fundamental causes of those harms are given a pass until all the data are counted, that's racial antimatter. Now, when this kind of knowledge and science is wielded by an openly white supremacist and authoritarian regime, as just happened, what might normally only be kind of a distracting form of kind of liberalized structural gaslighting uh, turns into a form of weaponized knowledge that can be used for targeted medical neglect. Given all this, I want to ask us, you know, what will the future racial spectrum look like? And what is the role of health disparities data scientists in building that spectacle? What is the role of health journalism and media corporations in promulgating and, and the recircling these ideas? How can we ensure that the future spectacle actually bends back toward the kind of black mattering we want and not toward the black anti-mattering we don't want? And taking this approach, that I've kind of advocated in this talk, scholars should not view the COVID-19 data archive as somehow walled off from the broader social world by this kind of veil of objectivity, oh, trust science or liberal progressivism, science will help, but rather see how social and cultural forces directly shape the production of the archive and the cultural forces um, and the, pardon me, and the, the philosophical and interpretive frameworks we use to make sense of the data we've got. In other words, we must place the institutions that produce racial data under the electron microscope to see how social and political forces shape not only what is studied in racial health disparities research, but also what we consider to be true about bodies and health, 
and why illness manifests in different groups for sure, but most importantly, what we ought to do about it. So with that, I want to thank you and offer peace to you. Um, I'm, I'm stunned that there's so many beautiful faces in this, in this room. I'm going to stop my sharing and come back to with you. And uh, thank you for your patient attention. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Dr. Hatch. Um, wow, that was amazing. Um, I'm going to allow you to, um, yes. to respond to the question that will come in the chat box. Um, and so if, if you have a question now for Dr. Hatch, I'm going to ask you just to type it into the chat. And that, that time, yeah, time permitting, um, he, he will sort of answer um, questions. Right. And we, we are being recorded, but I also invite you, if you have trouble typing or want to just unmute your audio or your video, you can there's a raised hand function as well. Under reactions, you can raise your hand and then we can quickly identify you. Sometimes after a talk like this, you, you need like a minute because you had your bell rung. <laughs> so you need a moment to kind of gather your thoughts and formulate an idea. So I'm happy to wait a moment for that. Um, it raises questions about what we're going to do next, obviously, so uh, and how we proceed. So Anne-Marie, please go ahead. I see, and I, again, it, it orders you up. So, Henry, go ahead. Uh, you can, un, they may have to, let's see if we can. Okay, I got it. I think you can hear now, yes? Yes, we can. Thank you. So, Dr. Hatch, thank you very much. I know I did some pre-work with you as well, and you had provided some readings that I shared with my classes. So, thank you very much. Um, so, my background is I'm nursing. I'm a nurse. Uh, I'm a PhD prepared nurse. Um, my doctoral work and some of my training includes grounded theory methodology, which comes from the sociology background. Are you familiar with it? Absolutely. So um, our, our dear, one of the co-creators, Dr. Glazer, I only recently learned just yesterday that he had died within the last two weeks. And he had some progressive thoughts, I thought, about um, demographic categories, race being one of them. And I'm just curious, in this veil of objectivity, where do you see the role for qualitative data? And how could we possibly take a look at some of these issues with either um, you know, qualitative methodologies or mixed methods? Thank you. This is this is an, an important question for all the students and, and as a, a question I routinely recon, reconsider, and this is a question of methods and and the, the research methodologies we, research methodologies we use to gather data to evaluate hypotheses that pertain to the questions we have, and so. The question formation process is very important like whose questions are being asked. Right? Who gets to decide and determine the rules governing evidence and admission of evidence? Well, whose evidence counts? What forms of evidence count? Part of the fixation on numbers and datification, quantification, is because we're talking about a nation state, we're talking about corporations, and we're talking about insurance companies. And those three institutions have essentially conspired over the last 150 years or so to create this institutional context. And now that's been internetified and digitized and flipped in all sorts of ways. Um, so uh, those quantitative data have been become part of the structure of governing in, in modern nation states. So absolutely other forms of data, qualitative data, for example, narrative data uh, and, and, and evidence to think about it more broadly, of course, shed key light on processes that those data often miss because of their often reducing effects, right? We reduce a complex process into a number, we recode it, and somehow we lose some of that variability and that nuance or some of the contingent effects that sometimes you, you lose when you have to place a nonlinear process into a linear framework. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I've, I've always been drawn to um, the kind of sympathetic, sympathetic to the idea that you need to use the methods that pertain to the question you're asking. So if we're constantly asking the question, well, how many black people have died? Well, the way to do that is to do, do some surveys and do this kind of demography. But if we want to understand how black people survive, 
then maybe that's not a question that's amenable to that to that methodology. So, of you know the the I'm absolutely you know a, a proponent, not even just a proponent, but a practitioner of of engaging those kind of multimodal uh, creative expression, the arts, um, as well as performance, as well as these forms of social science making, as well as science making, um, to to the project of justice. So um, absolutely, Alexa, hello. I think it's a call-in show. Alexa, hi. <laughs> yes, hi, how are you? Um, thank you so much for this talk. I feel like there are so many things to think with here. Um, so I have lots and lots of questions, but I'll just start, have one um, <laughs> to be fair to all others. Um, but I'm thinking about, uh, for example, the work of folks like uh, my colleague, Dr. Alondra Nelson. And I'm wondering if you see social movements as part of the antidote um, to what you're talking about. I'm thinking about you know, the work on the Black Panthers or the Young Lords. Um, we're going to be my class will be reading about some of that work later in the semester, but as um, I wondered if you just had thoughts about that kind of work as well as the academic work or the interface there. Absolutely, and thank you for for referencing Alondra Nelson's work, um, um, her book Body and Soul on the Black Panther parties. Um, uh, uh, making central questions of health and 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 medicine and care, community care, central to their work. Um, you know, I, I consider Dr. Nelson to be, you know, uh, not, uh, 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 certainly a colleague whose work I have had great respect for over many years, and encourage students to check that that book out as well as her, her the brilliant social life of DNA um, for understanding the kind of complex ways in which science um, helps us think about kinship and ancestry differently. And what I would say is that. Um, this talk and this lecture has, has had me thinking about this in a new way, and that's thinking about the social movement of scientists, of which I'm a part, that has really wanted to bring, you know, um, the tools of data science, the tools of empirical research and rigor to the problem of health inequality. And like, why are we stalled out now? Why are we fatigued? Why does it seem like we've been working at this and we can't get traction. So almost applying a kind of social movements lens to this work in scientific communities to try to understand better kind of what the roadblocks are. And, and I think in this, at least in the context of this paper, it's trying to identify what may be a certain kind of trap or a certain kind of uh, usurpation or taking up of our work um, that actually works against us in a kind of feedback you know, kind of cultural feedback loop, like, yes, you're producing knowledge of this data, but then it also kind of has this perverse effect. Um, now, um, in the paper, I argue that Afro pessimism, I think, offers us a kind of off ramp from this kind of thinking that that these institutions are going to come and save us one day that, you know, maybe if they had the data one day. So it, it's really gestures towards I mean, I, and I talk about this in the article, which I'm happy to share back with the Wagner community when it, it's literally almost done. Uh, um, uh, you know, it just reminds us that the way we care for each other, the way we the way we survive this and other calamities um, is not by relying on these institutions necessarily, but by also cultivating much more local ties, local networks of care that are not linked um, to these kind of um, macro institutions, um, which aren't designed for that purpose, at least not in their current configuration. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious again, students, don't be shy. Oh, go ahead, Alexa, if you were, you were trying to say. All right. Are there any other questions? Oh, yes. Thank oh, okay, you. we do have one. Uh, Alexa says I can't unmute myself again. <laughs> okay, try it now. Oh, she was just trying to. I just to... wanted to say thank you for the answer. <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. So, are there any other questions? Yeah. All right. Well, I just want to take this opportunity to thank Dr. Hatch for spending the day with us. Um, your research is really amazing. And um, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to welcome you back when the pandemic is finally done with us and we can meet you in person and discuss some of your ideas um, at length. So thank you everyone.
for celebrating Black History Month with us. And um, we look forward to you attending other events this month. Take care, everyone. Bye now. <laughs>